There are some kinds of wisdom only great suffering can bring. I remember my time in the Bardo with this in mind, for otherwise, the memory might drive me insane. The night my heart stopped for nearly three minutes started off normally enough. I was working as a nurse in a psychiatric ward at a hospital in the state's capital. Most of the patients there were harmless, most just suicidal attempts or people suffering from drug psychosis or severe depression. But some were actively dangerous and certainly psychopathic in every sense of the word. The new admission was one of these. A 300 pound black man with a long history of smoking PCP, schizophrenia and violent psychotic breaks from reality. His eyes looked like flat pieces of slate as I walked in for my shift. They looked as blank and emotionless as the eyes of a doll. He sat at the table in the front room where the patients ate or played cards alone under the bright fluorescent lights of the hospital. I walked to the station, where another psychiatric nurse named Ricardo was sitting behind the desk. What's the deal with the new guy? I asked him. Ricardo looked up, his dark Spanish face forming into a deep scowl. He ran his fingers through his jet black hair nervously. He's trouble, man, he said in a crisp accent. He got into a chase with the police and then punched some cops in the face. It took three guys to take him down, even after he got maced and tased. The judge sent him here for a temporary court order since he claims he had been getting chased by Nazis and UFOs and that's why he ran from the cops. He thought the cops in their uniforms were actually the SS and the helicopters were alien spacecrafts or something. I don't know. I didn't listen to the whole story. You have this on file? I asked. Ricardo leafed through his stack of folders with his thin fingers, snatching one out and handing it to me. I looked down, reading the information. Jeremiah Brown, black male, 37 years old. History. Substance abuse. Schizophrenia. Antisocial personality disorder. Psychiatrics note. This patient has scored a 36 out of 40 on the hair psychopathy checklist. While I am always hesitant to label a patient as an antisocial personality, a combination of factors had made it essential for this patient. Patient has an extensive criminal history, as well as a lengthy history of involuntary psychiatric admissions. He has been diagnosed as having antisocial traits since he was a young teenager. Patient has a long history of violence and suicide attempts. He has a history of imprisonment for manslaughter, armed robbery, grand theft, and aggravated assault. Upon discharge, he refuses to take any antipsychotic medication, citing these side effects as the reason. Long-term prognosis is poor. I had not been sleeping well the past few weeks. I rubbed my eyes as I read through the file, feeling exhausted. I tried putting on lucid dreaming or meditation music from YouTube to help me sleep, but whenever I closed my eyes, I saw horrible things. Chalk white female faces whose lips were cut into an insane rictus grin, flicking their heads violently from side to side and gnashing their fangs at the air. I had a feeling that many years of constantly watching horror movies and serial killer documentaries was catching up with me. As I read through the file, a student nurse came around the corner wearing a white state university outfit and a name tag that said Caitlin. I looked up, seeing Ricardo wink at me from where he was sitting in his chair behind the main desk. She's going to follow you, he said. Inwardly, I groaned, but I managed to force a smile. Oh, great, I said. She looked like she was probably no older than 19 or 20. She had a pretty body, but her face looked strange. 
All the angles were too sharp and her nose too large. I knew the patients here wouldn't care though. They would hit on anything. I sensed trouble. I looked down at my watch. Well, I'm Jay, and you already know Ricardo, I guess. It's good timing because we need to give you medications every day at 9am. And we have a new patient, so we could introduce ourselves. I said, giving her a faint smile. That's exciting, Caitlin whispered. I wanted to roll my eyes. It was definitely not exciting. I motioned her to follow me as I made my way to the medication room, which was really just a closet off the main day room. I had to enter my code on the keypad, and then, once inside, enter it again along with the patient's number and date of birth. The correct drawers for the medication in each specific dose would fly open, making it extremely hard for the wrong medications or doses to be given, unless it was done intentionally. Okay, so for this patient, we need Herdal, Antivin, and... I began saying to Caitlin when the yelling started. It came out faintly, rising in volume and anger within seconds. I heard Ricardo's Spanish voice, filled with panic. Something slammed hard against a wall, once, twice, three times. And then I heard the sound of glass breaking. I jumped, spinning around, but I couldn't see much through the small, shatterproof glass pane on the wooden door. Stay here, I demanded, seeing Caitlin's eyes widen, her freckled skin looking much paler than when she had first come in. Don't leave until I come back and say that it's safe. On the speaker strung throughout the hospital, I heard the first of the warnings echo out around us. Dr. Strong, Dr. Strong, please report to the seventh floor. A robotic female voice said calmly, using the code for when a patient had to be subdued by force. I pushed the door open, slamming it shut behind me so that the lock would activate and protect Caitlin from whatever chaos was going on. I heard Ricardo pleading with someone at the end of the hallway that ran past the main desk. He sounded strange as if he was trying to talk through a mouthful of blood. Huddled behind the main computer, I saw one of the CNAs frantically whispering something in the phone. She must have been the one to call the Dr. Strong order. You don't have to do this, man! Ricardo gurgled faintly. I couldn't see what was happening, as Jeremiah's large body was blocking my view. I could see that the thick glass window at the end of the hallway was broken, however. My heart skipped a beat as I surmised what was likely happening. I sprinted forward as quietly as I could, but the large man heard me. His massive body turned, his flat, dead eyes scanning me with absolute coldness and calm. I saw he had a bleeding Ricardo in his hands. Ricardo's back and head were covered in deep cuts and shards of glass. He must have used Ricardo's body as a battering ram to break the thick glass window. Jeremiah held Ricardo suspended halfway out of the window, seven floors above the concrete walkways far below. Stay back or this guy's gonna know what it feels like to fly, Jeremiah said in a deep, gravely voice. He shook Ricardo for emphasis sending his head snapping back and forth with painful cracking sounds. Drops of blood flew from his nose and a deep gash across his cheek. Pieces of shattered glass littered the carpet, shining like countless tiny stars. I put my hands up, taking a step back. Far behind me, I heard the front door for the psychiatric ward open. Voices echoed down the hall. Knowing that reinforcements were coming, I tried to buy some time. Let's talk about this, I said, taking a step forward slowly. You don't want a murder charge, do you? You'll never see the sky again. I don't give a crap. I'm not afraid to die, Jeremiah screamed, pushing Ricardo onto one of the shards of broken glass still attached to the windowsill. 
It bit deeply into the back of his neck, sending fresh streams of blood rushing out, dripping down to the pavement far below. I heard security guards and doctors running down the hallway behind me, their voices frantic and excited. Jeremiah saw them coming. With an animalistic panic in his eyes, he lifted Ricardo up. I cried out something, stepping forward, but it was already too late. In horror, I watched as he threw Ricardo out the window. I watched Ricardo's body soar in a graceful arc, his arms grabbing at empty air as a scream rippled its way out of his throat. Within a fraction of a second, he had disappeared from view, but his terrified shriek floated up to us for what seemed like a very long time. His screams ended abruptly as a shattering of bones and a wet smacking sound exploded far below us. Jeremiah turned to me, his large body moving faster than seemed possible. In his hand, I saw a piece of broken glass, five or six inches long and as sharp as a dagger. I tried the turn and run, but he was fast and strong. He lunged forward, his arm coming in a blur towards my neck. The shard entered my skin with a cold, numbing pain. I felt it slice through the flesh easily, felt the blood bubbling up my throat as I tried the scream, choking. The taste of iron filled my mouth as I fell backwards. I was suffocating, I knew. I must be dying. Something cold ran down my body, gripping my heart like freezing skeletal hands. The world swam around me and turned black, and then I was rising into a tunnel. At first it was dark, filled with flickering shadows, but a fiery red light appeared at the end. I followed it, no more than a screaming mass of cautiousness rising into infinity. I rose up through the end of the tunnel and found myself in an empty hospital ward. It looked identical to the psychiatric ward I had just come from. It even had the same smashed, blood-streaked window at the end of the hallway. A massive puddle of blood around ten feet away marked the spot where I must have died. But the fluorescent lights overhead here were flickering and many had gone totally dark. The shadows seemed to press in on all sides. The door to the patient's rooms were all tightly shut. I felt watched, afraid to call out or make any noise. I started walking down the hallway back towards the day room where the front desk was. All the lights there were off. A thick curtain of shadows hung in the air. You can come out. A male voice as smooth as glass called from the darkness. I jumped, my head flicking in random directions, but I saw nothing. The voice almost sounded like it had an English lift to it, a slight cockneyed accent. I know you're there. Who's there? I called out, not stepping forward. Show yourself. As you wish. The voice hissed. But I think you'll regret it. The darkness spat apart as if a nuclear missile had exploded. I raised my hand to shield my face, but the light and heat kept pouring out all around me. It blinded me, causing a rainbow of colors and shapes to morph behind my closed eyelids. After a few seconds, it subsided. Blinking rapidly, I squinted in the direction the voice had come from. A male figure stood there, bathed in a silhouette of light. His face looked as white and as smooth as marble. His eyes were pits of darkness that seemed to flicker and burn. Two black, rotted wings surrounded his body, all sharp angles and thin, curving bones. His body was clothed in silky, blood-red robes, and a hood covered his platinum blonde hair. He looked something similar to Leonardo DiCaprio, if he was possessed by some ancient god. 
and it immediately threw me off guard. If I were dying, and this was a hallucination of my brain, why would I be hallucinating Mr. DiCaprio? Who are you? I asked, taking a hesitant step back. Where am I? My name is Lucifer, the bringer of light and wisdom, and you are in the Bardo. He answered. Oh, I said, my heart dropping. Well, that's not good. Are you here to torture me and drag me to hell or something? You are that Lucifer, right? The accuser of God and the father of all lies? So they say that, but like most things in your world, the words of the powerful and your rulers are the true lies. They call me the accuser, but of what am I accused? He spoke in a voice that rose like smoke. Of bringing knowledge and wisdom to humanity by telling them to eat the tree of knowledge? The tree that would cause them to rise above the animals? Indeed, at the beginning, I saw the creation. I was there at the Alpha, standing by the side of God with all the angels as the universe became into being. The endless procession of light, the power of it, was something remarkable to behold. God is indeed the source of great power, but his consciousness is not what the believers say. After the creation of the universe, I saw his plan, how he ripped eternal souls from the source to imprison them. I saw how he took those divine sparks and forced them, screaming and wailing, into bodies made of meat to die over and over again. He said it was part of the plan, the great divine plan, a plan of death and destruction, constant suffering and mindless agony. And the worst part was, he wanted to give humanity neither the knowledge of good nor evil, nor the tree of life. I convinced them to eat the fruit so they could open their eyes to the nakedness, to their basic animal instinct, so they could rise up out of it forever. Like Prometheus, I brought down the fire, and yet they call me the accuser. God was insane long before he formed the universe. These holy men, they live and die in fanatical adoration to a divine being who is, in fact, totally indifferent to them. His consciousness twists and distorts, eating itself for all eternity. God feeds off the pain of others, for if his mind is burning, then all others should burn as well. When these holy men die, God will send their souls here to the Bardo to suffer every evil they have ever done. The wisdom I brought those who called upon me freed them from this prison, and in exchange, the holy men burned them alive. I offered the wisdom that opens your eyes, but it has been forgotten and cursed. Lucifer's body began to dissolve, drifting up into the air like ashes. All around me a low, powerful current blew, a tornado that spiraled high up into the clouds. Like some sort of Cheshire Cat, his smooth voice continued to echo all around me, even as the form of Lucifer disappeared. And yet you have no wisdom. For that, like all the others who entered the Bardo, you must suffer. Everything you've done. Every small hurt and agony inflicted on others comes back a thousandfold in this place. But don't be afraid. How could I not be afraid? I screamed into the ward, but I found myself alone, the question hanging unanswered in the air. The lights continued to flicker all down the hallway, feeling strange and dissociated. I stumbled over to one of the windows. As I gazed out, I beheld a strange and alien world. The sky was flat and gray. It stayed in constant motion, swirling and spiraling like clouds of rolling smoke. There was no sun or moon, no stars, only the strange shifting whirls of clouds. The streets were filled with burnt-out husks of cars and mummified bodies hung from street lamps. 
Other signs of carnage and bloodshed covered the apocalyptic streets. I saw what looked like shadows in the shape of people slinking through over the sidewalks, past rotting dogs and streaks of clotted blood. They had no features on their blank dark bodies. They seemed to skitter and jerk forwards in eerie twisting motions. Horrified, I turned away, realizing I was no longer alone in the day room. In the day room, there were dozens of tables set up in a rectangular perimeter that was walled in by a cosmetic walls only four feet high. It was where the patients sat and played games or ate. Under the flickering lights, I now saw each of the chairs filled with faceless mannequins. Many were dressed in Victorian suits and top hats. The women had frilly dresses of pink and blue that may have been fashionable in the 1800s. As the lights strobed on and off overhead, I realized with an increasing sense of disquiet that the mannequins were moving each time it went dark. When I had first seen them, they were mostly posed to look like they were staring across the tables at each other, even though they had no eyes. Just smooth, fresh colored plastic. Now all of them were looking directly at me. Some were pointing or raising their hands in my direction. At the tips of their fingers, I saw the glittering of steel. The lights continued to flicker, and the mannequins rose from their chairs in the short periods of darkness, moving towards me in synchronized, strobing motions. Frantically, I ran down the hallway back towards the broken window. In each of the rooms, I caught glimpses of something from a nightmare peeking out. I hadn't been sleeping well lately, and when I had closed my eyes, I often saw ancient hags with chalk white skin and yellowed broken teeth whose jaws unhinged, their faces jerking in ways that reminded me of mannequins. Now on both sides of me, I saw these same figures. They moved continuously out of the rooms, drawing closer with every breath. I looked back, seeing the mannequins only a few steps behind me. I continued sprinting towards the broken window, where the hallway ended in a wall. I didn't know what would happen when I reached it. At that moment, there was no rational thought. I felt like a deer being chased down by a pack of wolves, feeling waves of blind panic and mortal terror rushing through my body. But as I reached the end of the hallway, the end of my rope as it were, a blast of noise started seeming to come from the walls of the building and the sky itself. It sounded like a siren, a low, drawn-out drone of a demonic whale call, rising and falling in crashing crescendos. The mannequins froze in place once again. The strange, witch-like creatures slunk back into the dark rooms. I looked outside the broken window, seeing clouds of black smoke rising off in the distance. The flickering of massive infernos scorched the land, drawing nearer by the second. The siren sound faded slowly, like the dying echoes of a gong. I was surrounded by dozens of mannequins. Their sharp hands were inches away from my face and neck. I saw metal glittering all around me and realized they had sharp points of nails protruding from the ends of their fingers. I was afraid to move but I heard a familiar voice from down the hall. It was the confident voice of Lucifer. The sirens mean much worse nightmares than this are coming in the Bardo, he said, his glossy black eyes flashing with intelligence. He walked slowly towards me, his face grim and pale. Hell itself is coming over the land. This building is no more than a construction of your dying mind, but the world outside is real. How could hell come and go? I asked, confused. Isn't hell a place? Hell is a monster, a beast with many mouths and many eyes. Lucifer responded. It eats constantly, but its hunger never ends. Look, the first of the sacrifices scatter like cockroaches. 
He points out the broken window, pushing his way through the mannequins effortlessly. I glanced outside, seeing thousands of people sprinting down the dark city streets. The inferno and thick clouds of smoke had moved much closer, and every few seconds, the ground shook slightly, as if we were experiencing the aftershocks of an earthquake. What could I do against such a beast? I asked, my heart freezing with terror. But when I looked back over, I saw his form dissolving again, becoming translucent and drifting away like ashes. It seemed even Lucifer didn't want to be present when this hell beast arrived. Seek divine wisdom, he said, his voice trailing off into whispers. Remember the source. Now, crowds of tens of thousands of people were streaming into the city, filling every single inch of the streets. Their panic and fear was contagious. I felt it rising inside my body like a snake spiraling up my spine. I took off down the hallway, running through the swarm of frozen mannequins, each in their own ferocious position of attack. The lights flickered faster and went out. Yet the fires outside cast the entire world in a bloody glow, giving me enough light to see by and find my way. I sprinted down the stairway, taking them two steps at a time. The screaming outside grew louder and more pain-filled. The shaking off the ground worsened with every passing sound. I burst out of the front entrance, seeing a world on fire all around me. Thousands of crushed, bleeding, and burning bodies stretched out as far as the eye could see. Behind all this chaos and death, I saw a monster of unimaginable proportions slinking its way towards me. Lucifer was right, I realized. Hell was not a place, but a creature. An enormous monster the size of a town. It had thousands of skittering jointed legs that looked like little more than skeletal arms and hands, each of them dozens of feet long and white as freshly cut marble. Its body stretched out to the horizon, an enormous blood-red cylinder of bony plates that slithered and undulated with a serpent's grace. Waves of peristalsis traveled down its length like writhing intestines. Thousands of curving bony spikes stabbed out of it, pointing in every direction. Like the quills of a porcupine, it would protect the massive creature's body from any form of attack. If anything was big enough to attack such an abomination. Hell's massive eyes flickered, balls of fire that spun and danced. They looked as bright as the sun. Something like solar flares seemed to emanate from its orbs, flashes of blinding energy that floated over the apocalyptic wasteland. And its many legs smashed the ground. They left trails of fire that caused everything to explode into flames as if napalm dripped from its limbs. But Hell's most terrifying feature was its seven dark mouths. Its body looked a thousand feet wide and the mouths at the front were evenly dispersed. At the front, blood-red teeth in the shape of enormous railroad spikes shone. Its lipless skeletal face grinned as it moved forward, shaking the ground with every step. The mouths were on long, snake-like necks that could stretch out hundreds of feet. They moved forward in a blur, snapping up as many panicked souls as they could. Countless souls in the rocky plains of the Bardo ran for their lives, away from this juggernaut. I saw men and women who looked like they came from every country and profession, some dressed in suits or spotless white lab coats, others wearing rags or orange prison jumpsuits. And yet, they all screamed in agony and fear here, their bodies pressed together in a crowd and no one seemed to remember anything but their own mortal terror. Their voices came out faint and weak next to the roaring of hell. It shook the ground all around us, as if an earthquake were tearing the land apart. 
The first frantic runners of the surging crowd had nearly reached me. The nearest person, a young woman in her mid-twenties dressed in all white, was only ten feet behind me. She looked like she had come from wealth, and even from here, I could see a ring with a massive diamond gleaming on her finger. I took off blindly down the familiar streets of the city where I had worked and lived, but these also seemed different. The church down the street from the hospital where I had worked had a satanic pentagram instead of a cross now. Its exterior painted a bright gleaming blood red. When I had driven past it today on my way to work, I remembered it read. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now it read, Nietzsche said, Of all evil I deem you capable. I have often laughed at the weaklings who thought themselves good simply because they have no claws. I wonder what that meant. Was that some sort of comment on me or on all of us here? The woman I had seen running had caught up with me. She was fast, much faster than her slim body suggested. Her blue eyes were frantic and wild, filled with an animal panic. It's right behind us, she screamed, her face covered in a sheen of sweat. I was afraid to turn and look, but I could hear the chaos and bloodshed approaching, smell the flames and choking smoke. Run, get away. A new wave of energy surged through my body. I sprinted as fast as I could down the strange mirror streets of the Bardot. I heard the agonized cries of countless souls behind us as the seven mouths of hell ate them all greedily and then looked for more. The skyscraper behind us collapsed into a pile of rubble, shaking the ground with a cacophony of falling concrete and shattering glass. The woman was running by my side. Just as I heard the breathing of something huge and predatory right behind us and smelled its sulfuric breath, a piece of concrete the size of a basketball broke off the collapsing skyscraper and flew off into the road. I tripped over it, yelling as I flew through the air, skinning my arms and legs on the pavement. The woman's eyes widened. Hurriedly, she came over and reached down her hand, trying to help me up. Come on, come on, she cried. I looked behind her, seeing one of the gnashing mouths of hell reaching forward on a blood-red serpentine neck. The mouth was big enough to drive a tractor trailer into, filled with the huge spikes of teeth. Its throat led into a black smoke-filled abyss. Its fiery eyes were filling pools of flickering orange light that shone with bloodlust and insanity. They focused on the woman, the entire head turning on its slithering neck. I frantically raised my hand, intertwining my fingers with hers. Her hand was warm and soft. She started to pull me to my feet and then the mouth of the hell snapped forward. Its jaw unhinged, scraping the pavement with the sound like grinding metal. The woman barely had time to turn as the mouth covered her and snapped her shut with a crack. She disappeared from view instantly, but I was still holding on her hand. In horror, I felt warm rivers of blood explode all over my body as the mouth of hell severed her arm at the wrist. She screamed, bleeding and crying, as she disappeared into the throat of hell. Hell's fiery eyes focused on me, and at that moment, I knew I was next. Its mouth opened up wide again, like a bear trap ready to spring on a new victim. It was dark in Hell's mouth, but I smelled the thick reek of old blood and fire. I caught glimpses of tortured, mutilated bodies writhing and crawling down its throat. Shell-shocked, I could only lay there and watch. And that's when the strange doubling started. I heard the frantic voices of men break through the fog of darkness and the fetid reek of blood. There was a mechanical beeping all around me, but I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Clear? One cried. 
I looked around, only seeing blackness. At that moment, I felt a surge of electricity rip inside through my body. My arms and legs all seized and my eyes rolled up into my head as the pain sizzled through each one of my nerves. I clutched the young woman's hand tightly, feeling the large gold ring with the massive diamond biting into my skin. Again! Another voice yelled. Clear! The original voice cried. The electricity came again and a flash of white light flew across my vision. I blinked, seeing two sets of eyes at the same time, one of the bar dough and one of the blood-stained floor of the hospital ward. The bar dough stayed dark and sinister, but the clear white lights of the real psychiatric ward were blinding. It was a bizarre experience. Moreover, everything hurt. Over a few seconds, my vision of the Bardo faded, and I was simply a gravely injured man laying on the floor in a puddle of blood. Four doctors and paramedics were crouched over me. My shirt was ripped off, and nearly all of my skin was covered in blood. I raised my left hand, trying to talk, but only a fiery pain raced through my neck. I felt bandages covering my skin. A nurse was rolling a stretcher down the hallway towards me. It's okay, one of the doctors said, kneeling down. You're being taken to the emergency surgery. You've lost a lot of blood. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't talk with a massive slice in my neck. At that moment, I felt something in my right hand. I looked down, seeing a slim female hand with a massive diamond ring hanging there. Our fingers were wrapped together in each other's but the hand had been cut off at the wrist. A ragged patch of bloody flesh and snapped bone poked out of the back. <sighs> I tried to say, shaking my head. I felt fresh streams of warm blood open up. No. The doctors looked down, seeing the dismembered hand. Their faces morphed into expressions of confusion and fear. I closed my eyes as they lifted me up on the stretcher. One of them gently removed the cold hand from my fingers, but they could never remove the memory of what I had seen. I know what happens after death, and it makes the worst life here seem like a dream. I know that one day I'll be returned to that place. I know that one day I'll see that great monster called Hell and the featureless swirling sky of the Bardo again. And the next time, I won't wake up on a hospital floor, but will be trapped there with the others for eternity. An eternity of blood and fire. <laughs>